So welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we continue with the Gaussian mixture model. And k means and expectation maximization. So today we will um, continue with some intuitive derivations for the Gaussian mixture model, but then I also show you a somewhat more rigorous way to think about expectation maximization and finally even some other optimization tricks that might be useful elsewhere as well. Okay, so let's go where we were. We were um, that we had the Gaussian mixture model. Maybe I show you that one first. So we considered this model that we have a mixture of Gaussian, which is basically summation of several other densities that are weighted, right? And I also explained to you already this comes up naturally if we introduce a latent variable. The question is, given some data, um, how can we estimate the parameters of our model? And there we've seen um, that these update equations, which kind of intuitively make sense, so we justified them that they are kind of a soft version of the k-means algorithm, so that was our first way to derive it, right? Which is okay, and then we can play around with it and it ideally works very well. Then a second version was that we set the derivatives of the log likelihoods to zero, and um, that is also somewhat heuristic because the tau i depend on the parameters. Let me show you again. So we had these derivatives and set them to zero. However, setting them to zero, we even have some additional side constraint here. And the um, problem is that we kind of assumed that this fraction in front, we gave it a name, the tau sub i. And we said that one is constant with respect to the parameters. However, it is not. So if we solve the first equation for pi sub k, there are lots of pi sub, there's also another pi sub k down here in the summation, and there's another one on the top. So it's more complicated than just isolating the bottom one over here, right? So it was a bit cheating. Of course, we could write down Lagrange here, and I just did it here that in principle we could do it. But nonetheless, it's a complicated system of equations. And often in numerics, if we get such a system, we are happy and we say, great, we run it, we just iterate it and hope for a fixed point. And often it works. In this case, it also works. However, um, there is a third way to do this, and this will be done today. So again, we will look at this latent variable and we see how we can um, complete the data set by adding the latent variance variables to our data set and then writing everything down and doing maximum likelihood and some clever expectation. And that will lead to a more general point of view on, on this um, update equation. So basically, we will say that there are these parameters like mu and sigma. And uh, so the mu and the sigma, which is not appear, oh yeah, it's over here, and the, the pi sub i, those are parameter theta and the tau i also depends on these parameters. However, it's a clever way kind of to freeze the theta, the parameters to calculate the tau i, and then we update the theta, and then again we update our tau i, and this alternating thing, it could be derived in a different way from a more general point of view. And along the way, we will see some entropy and some kullback liebler divergence, so all a lot of fun stuff, which comes from information theory. Okay, so far so good. So I talked about these slides. So ah, here's some more details, but let's forget about this approach. So this constraint optimization problem in principle could be formulated, but it's still a very complicated system which is very non-convex in the parameters. So it can be optimized by using more unknowns. And we did that already at the beginning of the last lecture. We said, let's introduce a latent variable z, yeah, going from one to k, and let's introduce this more complete way of writing our model. So we now have a new random variable z, which has a certain discrete distribution. And then we have this conditional distribution of the x given a particular point, z being equal to k. And if we then write out the marginal distribution with respect to x, we get exactly our mixture of Gaussians as before. So far, so good. Um, However, now we could also view it as the thetas are the parameters of our model. They are unknown, but the z's are also unknown, so we don't have them. So we could treat them all um, as something that we would like to estimate. So we could estimate the z, and we could try to estimate the, the tau, uh, the theta. 
As it turns out, estimating the z at the end means estimating the tau sub i. So it will be the same algorithm as before, but like described from a different perspective. Um, so the question, does it really help us? The answer will be not immediately, since the z's are unknown. So we also need to estimate them. We can't immediately use the z's. However, once we have the z's, um, we will have a much simpler problem because now we can write down the so-called complete data log likelihood, which I show you next. Okay, so here comes the complete data log likelihood. So here's the new data set, the data set sub C for complete, and it's the pairs of X i's and Z i's. Okay, and for that one, I can also write down the log likelihood, which is now an L sub C for complete, and it's the probability of seeing this complete data given my parameters. So if you plug everything in, then first of all notice now we have the logarithm of p of x comma z and before we had the logarithm of p of x and that's it okay and the z was basically in the summation so now we have a different expression here which we now can plug in here the good thing is now the logarithm can go for the pi and it can go for the parameters in the gaussian distribution so the logarithm is not standing in front of a sum, sum anymore so that is a big difference now Instead, we can even rewrite this expression now nicely using this product, okay? So we can say it's a product of all possibilities now where each factor is to the power of an Iverson bracket, okay? So the Iverson bracket thing, I have on the next slide, that was this notation. In there goes a statement which evaluates to a Boolean, so it's either true or false. And if it's true, the value of the bracket is 1, otherwise it's 0. So for, for such a statement, I was in bracket of z equals k, it's either 1 or 0 depending on whether z is equal to k or not. So how did we rewrite this single factor? We rewrote it by um, a product over all possibilities now. So the pi sub zi is replaced by a pi sub k, and we ensure that the zi is equal to our k. Okay. So raising a factor to the power of 0 or 1 turns it into a 1, right? If it's a 0, or it turns it into the factor if the Iverson bracket evaluates to 1, okay? So this product here is now just a complicated way of writing this single factor, okay? Where the difference is now that the sub-indices, the mu sub zi, the sigma sub zi, are replaced by mu sub k and sigma sub k. Okay, interesting. In the mixture model formulation, we didn't have a product, but a summation. And there we had a problem with getting the logarithm into the summation. So there's no rule for that one. However, there is a rule for getting a logarithm into a product, right? We can just exchange them and turn the product into a summation, OK? And now we have the logarithm in front of some nice little product to the power of something. As you know, logarithm of a to the power of b is equal to b times logarithm of a. So we can drag out this exponent in front of the logarithm, OK? Here again, you see the power of using these Iverson brackets. You can just calculate around with them. You can push them around with the usual rules that you have. Then we have the logarithm of the pi sub k plus the logarithm of the Gaussian distribution. And now this is much nicer. If you take the derivative of this expression, yeah, everything works nicely because you can drag in the derivative up to here, and then you decide derivative with respect to pi or deriv de derivative with respect to mu or sigma. And everything is much simpler, and you get like nice expressions. So far, so good. Everyone happy with this derivation? OK. So let's compare the expressions again. So now we have an expression for the complete data log likelihood, which is nice and easy when we take, uh, when we take derivatives. And here's the unfortunate one where we have the logarithm of the summation, which cannot be simplified. So in the incomplete data log likelihood, unfortunately, every parameter is more coupled with every other parameter. And here we kind of split it by introducing our new latent variable z. So in the incomplete data log likelihood, the logarithm and the uh, summation cannot be swapped, OK? But in the complete, di likelihood, there's in, yeah, complete data log likelihood, there's no problem with that one. 
um, because we don't have a summation but a product, okay, since we know the right class. So here the thing is, we don't know the class of the xn, so we don't know which sum it is relevant, but here we kind of fix it by having additional data, okay? That's the whole trick. Okay, so if I fix now for simplicity the covariance matrices to be the identity matrix, then we get, as a special case, the update steps for the k-means algorithm, yeah? So if we set the derivative of the complete data log likelihood to zero, and solve it for the mu sub k, then we get exactly these updates that we used in the um, k-means case, okay? We also get the e-step, that is basically chosen by choosing now the zi to be the argmax of this local product here, of the local probability of seeing the data point. Then we get basically the assignment, yeah? And this is now different, differently written, so this is derived by setting the derivative to zero and solving for mu sub k, and this is more like saying, okay, if I choose my zi to be exactly z1, then I maximize the complete data log likelihood with respect to the z. Let's check back, so where does the z appear? The z appears really only in front, yeah? So by choosing the right summand, right, the one that is maximized, that's the one where I'm, um, how to maximize basically the complete data log likelihood. Maybe it's a bit confusing about the pi sub k, how this plays in here as well, but I think here we are just counting. So the, I think the pi sub k is not, um, not written down for the k-mean. So it's a bit hand wavy, the second step here. So it's not immediately following from the expressions that I showed you. Okay, let's get back to the more general complete data log likelihood, okay? So, in practice, of course, we don't have the complete data, so it's great that we now have a nice formula, but we can't use it if we don't have that data. So we have a so-called missing data problem, yeah? In general, a missing data problem is uh, you are collecting data and having a big Excel sheet of entries, and some entries have a not a number, for example, or hasn't been observed. It can happen if people fill out questionnaires and some questions are not answered. Yeah, so it's a very typical technical problem that you have. So the missing data problem is very, very common. Actually, the AM procedure, this expectation maximization procedure, which we see in more detail today, is a solution to the missing data problem in general, not only for the Gaussian mixture model, but you can apply it always, okay? So, what are we going to do? Um, the thing is, once we have the parameters theta, yeah, then we can use our incomplete data to derive a posterior distribution for our unknown variables. And we did that already earlier, okay? So let's look at that again. So basically, we can calculate these responsibilities. So by calculating the tau i sub k, they are called right now, so those are exactly the same tau at earlier in the lecture. And they are just the posterior probability distributions after seeing the locations, right? So that's basically the same slide as before. So given our x1 to xn and given our current fixed set of parameters, we can calculate these probabilities here. So we know something about the z. And now what z should be used? We should use the z uh, the expectations of these probability distributions. So those will be the ones that we should use for the z, okay? And that is the E step in EM, that we use, instead of using the z directly, we use the expectations of them. So let's calculate the posterior expectation that zi is equal to k, okay? So with other words now, we have some funny new expressions for the same stuff that we had before. So we had the tau sub ik already and we used it in our formulas, but now we have a better story how to derive it, okay? So we have the data set and we have a set of parameters which are fixed and now we are calculating the posterior distributions for our latent variables. Having these posterior distributions, I can ask, so what is the expectation of this assignment here, which is either zero or one, but the expectation, of course, could be a fraction as well, so it could be a number between zero and one. 
So Z is distributed according to our posterior distribution. If I plug everything in, it turns out those are exactly the tau sub i k that I calculated earlier. Okay. Why are we doing this again? First, we did it more intuitively, a bit more hand wavy, like you often see in a derivation of the k-means algorithm. Now we're doing it in a more rigorous setting where we introduce the latent variables and we are doing an expectation maximization approach. Okay. So, having now these expectations, let's calculate the expectation of the complete data log likelihood. Okay, so what was the complete data log likelihood? It was this expression, and it was a, a curly L. Okay, so that is the expression of the complete data log likelihood. And now we are taking the expectation of Z1 with respect to the Z variable. So we just put the expectation operator in front of Z1. And here note, I'm writing it down explicitly here because I'm using a small letter Z for the random variable Z. Okay. Typically, when we have expectations, you are looking for the capital letters, and those are the random variables with which we are taking an expectation. Here, it's not so obvious because I'm using the different notation, and that's why I put it here in front. OK, the z only appears in this Iverson bracket. So I can drag in the expectation operator. Since it's a linear operator, I can drag out the summation signs. OK, so nothing bad will happen. It's a finite sum anyway. OK, so far so good. And now we have the expectation already calculated, and we know that it's just tau i sub k, uh, tau i k, OK? Just as we had before. So now we have a name for this expression, where the tau i sub k have been calculated by some fixed parameter theta sub 0. OK, so that is one set of parameters, yeah? But there are other parameters, the ones that appear in the complete data log likelihood, and those are called theta. So the expected complete data log likelihood now has two types of theta. One with which we would like to optimize at the end, yeah, and we have the updates already, and another one which was used to calculate the expectation for the z. And now by alternatingly updating those, I'm doing an EM procedure. Okay? So, we found out the expected complete data log likelihood called Q now has basically the same form as the complete data log likelihood, but now we are more precise about who depends on whom. So the responsibilities, they depend on theta zero, and the joint log probabilities in the back here, they depend on a parameter set theta that we would like to optimize in the M step. Okay, so far so good. Okay. Now, when I fix the theta zero, that is like fixing the responsibilities and saying, I'm only taking the derivative of all appearances of pi, mu, and sigma that are not in the tau i k, right? Because I'm splitting them into different sets of parameters. So they are the theta zero, they are fixed. So the responsibilities are fixed. And now taking the derivative of the complete data log likelihood will give me these update expressions. Okay? So how did I do it? Basically by renaming all parameters that appear inside the tau to be theta zero, and all the others for which I calculate the derivative, I call them theta. And those are the ones that I'm optimizing. Okay, and this is the M step, and the M stands for maximize the expected complete log likelihood. Okay, so that is the M step. That is maximized here, the expected complete log likelihood with respect to the parameter theta. So far, so good. Let's look at the E step. For the E step, we fix the theta and we recalculate the responsibilities. So we are not recalculating the theta zero, but instead we are calculating the responsibilities. But you could also view it as setting theta zero to theta. Yeah? So in one step, we are optimizing the theta and keep theta zero fixed. And in the E step, basically, we are setting the theta to theta zero. But then we use that one to recalculate our responsibilities. So the E step, in words, is calculate the expected complete log likelihood by recomputing the responsibilities. OK, so far, so good. 
So those things I think I just said already. So the E step updated, updates the theta zero indirectly by updating the responsibilities. The M step really does update the theta using the derivatives. Yeah? And now the question is, is our E step also maximizing this function or not? So that is the question that we need to discuss further. So far so good? Okay. Then we get to expectation maximization from an even more general point of view, okay? To understand the M step and the E step a little bit better to see what they are doing. So here's a super general setting, and I think this super general setting I got from Mike Jordan's book. So let me see where I have the reference. I think I have it right at the beginning. Where is it? This one. So there, I think there's a book or something, an introduction to graphical models from 2003, and maybe it's only available as a PDF. But so that's basically where I got this super general view from. And I think it's useful to think about it very general, because then you can apply it also to a new problem, apart from the Gaussian mixture model, right, or apart from, from other things. So here's a very general setting. So we assume that we only look in a, at a single data point. So that's already interesting enough. Okay? So we have a single observed variable, and we have a single non-observable latent variable, and we have a joint probabilistic model, where I'm not specifying the particular form. Okay? The Gaussian mixture model is one possibility. Let's rewrite the first the incomplete log likelihood. So the incomplete log likelihood is the logarithm of p of x. Okay? And it can be rewritten as the logarithm of the summation. So it looks like a mixture model. Okay? So this is now our starting point. So actually, this is the one we would like to maximize in theta. So now we need to study how the m step and the e step are really, what are they doing with the log likelihood, with the incomplete log likelihood, the one that we actually would like to maximize. Okay? And for that now, we are massaging this expression a little bit and then find out that it can be nicely interpreted. So the first step we do is we add this Q of Z. Okay? We just multiply a, a 1, basically, just making the expression more complicated. So this holds for any distribution over Z. Okay, this is interesting. Later on, in the E step, we will update the distribution of the Z, right? By saying, I have new responsibilities, so I have new beliefs, I have a new posterior distribution for my Z variables. But it can be viewed very general, and we could say, we have a new distribution Q of Z in the E step. However, this expression holds for any Q, okay? So not only for the one that is maximizing something, sondern it can be any distribution Q. The only requirement is we don't want to have a division by zero. So the Q of Z should be non-zero, where we consider it. Yeah, this can always be achieved by restricting the summation for those values of the domain of Q. By the way, notice I'm writing it up here with a summation sign, but everything that I say in the general setting also holds for the integration, so also for continuous variables. OK. Let's derive now a lower bound for our incomplete data log likelihood. Okay? So here we go. Our log likelihood can be written as the logarithm of this summation from the previous slide. And now we can exchange the logarithm and this summation of the weighted sum here. So this can be seen like a weighted sum, where the Q of Z is the, our weights. Okay? And I'm exchanging the logarithm and the sum and the Q. And this is called Jensen's inequality. Okay? And I explain on the next slide what it really means. But let's see what's happening if I do this. If I do this, I get a new expression, and I know it will be less than or equal to the previous one. And this expression gets a name. Um, it is the so-called lower bound for the incomplete log likelihood. Later in deep learning, if we talk about, are we, in this lecture we won't do it, but if you learn about variational autoencoders, yeah, there we also have the elbow, the expected lower bound, and that's exactly the same trick as this one. So this is the typical derivation that people use in variational inference and in many other things. So that's why this inequality here is very important. So 
Before I explain Jensen's inequality, why does such a lower bound help us? Um, the idea is, instead of maximizing the log likelihood, which we found out is a very non-convex, very complicated problem because everyone is coupled with everyone, yeah, we maximize a lower bound, okay? And then hope for the best that maximizing the lower bound yeah, will also maximize the log likelihood. Notice the lower bound contains the theta that we are interested in and the q. So we can also optimize it in terms of the function q. Yeah? So not in terms of single values or parameters, but in terms of distribution. So we can find out the best distribution here that will maximize it as good as possible. Again, as a little preview, optimizing the lower bound in the theta will be the m step. Optimizing the lower bound in the q will be the e step. Okay, it's like updating the responsibilities. So now, what is Jensen's inequality? I haven't told you. Okay, let me show you. First of all, let's say we have a convex ver a function, okay? Hereby is again the definition. And um, this definition always should go with a picture on the board. So let me just quickly memorize it. Okay, so here's this definition and this is now greater or equal and this is a hard thing to memorize so it's less than or equal to alpha times f of x plus 1 minus alpha f of x so what does it say actually if this would be equality we would talk about linear functions right so for linear functions um, f of a sum is the sum of the results, okay? Or if I have scaling the input yeah, of the function, it's like scaling the output of the function. So this is linearity. So and if I turn this into an inequality, then I say this is, this, this is defined that f is a convex function. Okay, here comes the picture. So I think the right picture is Z1. So let's take a parabola. Now let's take two points. So this must be X1 and X2, right? Okay. So I'm having one point over here, X1. And here's another point, X2. Now alpha should be between 0 and 1. Okay, so for all alpha from this interval, I want to have this property, okay? So what does it do if I choose the alpha to be 0? Then basically I'm at, x, uh, I'm at x2, and if I set alpha to 1, then I'm at x1. And for all numbers in between, I'm somewhere in between. So I'm somewhere between here, between these points. And now, what am I calculating on the other side? So I'm having here, I'm having my f of x1, okay, great. And here I'm having my f of x2. And here I'm also interpolating between those two values. OK, so between those two values. So if I plot for all possible alphas this side over here, yeah, then I'm getting here the straight line. OK? So this is the linear function in alpha, right? f of x1 is a constant f of x2 is a constant, and then the whole thing is a linear function, and it's, it's exactly this linear function here. And now we are saying, so that here is a gap between the actual function value of something in between and the linearly interpolated one. Okay, so that is a convex function. I think I explained it already a couple of lectures ago, but it's good to see it again. So the other thing was, okay, if the area above the function is a convex set, so that's the other definition. Where convex set means I take two points and the straight line between them is also in that set. Okay, so that is the definition of a convex function. Of course, if um, f is convex, then let's define minus f to be concave. Is it with an e at the end? Yes, I think so. Um, so basically it means if the area under a function is convex, then the function is concave. 
Question? Yes, okay, let's, let's make it more precise. Very good. Yes, exactly. So it was a free variable here. My convention for free variable was that it's universally quantified. But no, this is nicer, of course. Okay, so far so good. Um, so a typical concave function, uh, so we see already now the parabola is a convex function. Yeah, the logarithm is, is one of the typical concave functions, right? So it looks like this. Okay. So, and there we see already, okay, interesting. So here is already kind of Jensen's inequality hidden in here, right? The input is a summation of two terms, yeah, and it's less than or equal to the summation of the functions, right? So if you write this more general, um, then basically I could say f of a summation of some values is less than or equal to the summation of f of the values. Okay, so this is just directly following from the definition of the convex functions. I can have it even more general, and I could say, okay, the alphas here, yeah, they should sum up to one, kind of, so I could also say I'm having some weights in front of here, yeah, then I also can drag out the weights, where the weights are now summing up to one, and the weights are, for all i, they are greater or equal to zero. Okay, so this is a more general statement like the one above. And we could have it even more general by using probability distributions. Okay, so suppose I'm having um, logarithm of the integration of whatever, some function fx px dx, then I can also apply Jensen's inequality and um, uh, how do I want to do it? Oh, this is the other way around. Okay, I'm having f of an integration. Ah, no, no, I'm mixing up. Okay, let's check again. I want to drag in the logarithm into something. Okay, I can also say this is less than or equal to the integration of px log f of x dx. And maybe I should rename, rename the f. I was confused by it. So let's say this is some other function h. Okay, because this is the f, right? So this is, however, it's a concave function, okay, then it's the other way around, okay. Yes, is this is right? Okay, thank you. What's that? Here? Ah, okay, yeah, then it should be the other way around. So let's say this one is con convex. Okay, great. Yeah, so basically this is the thing to remember, and I always have to look it up, which is which, or you have to draw a picture. Otherwise, I don't know, it's not easy to remember which is which. From this one, it's easy to see that you can do it for summations, finite summations, and from that one it's kind of generalizable to densities as well. Okay. Okay, so that is Jensen's inequality. So here we go. We can also use expectations, and that might be a form that you've seen before, right? So here we have f being logarithm, for example, or now f being a convex function, so it might be minus logarithm, and you can drag it into the integration. Okay, great. And um, the integration can be also seen as the expectation, right? And then you can exchange the expectation and the f and get an inequality. And again, if f is a linear function, yeah, it commutes with the expectation because the expectation is a linear operator. However, if the f is concave or convex, then basically you get an inequality. Okay, so far so good. So this is a very useful thing. And this explains why we wrote it why we extended this by q of z, okay? We only did it to apply Jensen's inequality. And now it's non-trivial. At this point now it's non-trivial anymore, so it doesn't disappear the q of z. So this is really a different expression from the one above here. So far so good? Okay, let's 
study it further. Ah, oh, okay, there are these other things that I just said. So a function g is concave if the area below the function is convex, and so on and so forth. And then Jensen's inequality just changes the signs, yeah, as I just said. Okay, great. So here's the question. Can you draw a function that is neither convex or concave, or can, we, can you tell me one? Yeah? Yes, very good. Yeah, sine, for example, is an example, right? Or another one would be, I don't know, something like this, x to the power of 3 plus blah, blah, blah. Something like this is also a function that is neither concave or convex. Again, this is like a, a, a mantra in optimization. It's not about whether a function is nonlinear or linear. That's not the big deal. The big deal is if your function is convex, then there are very nice methods to optimize them, right? Which kind of makes sense because then there is like something to fall into. Yeah? And if the function is neither convex nor concave, so if you have a mixture like this, then anything can happen and it could be arbitrarily complicated. And then optimization is really hard. So in our case, optimization is really hard and we replace it now by a lower bound, which has nicer properties, okay? So let's go back to our lower bound, this L of theta comma Q, okay? So that is the thing that we study next. Let's get a deep insight into the M step. So deep insight meaning I am excited to see this, that this is really true. So this is really cool that you can show this. Yeah, and again, I got it from the book from Mike Jordan. And so here's what I can show. Let me first show you what comes out. So the lower bound can be rewritten as the entropy, whatever that is, I explain on the next slide, and some other expression over here. So what is the first term? So that is the expected complete data log likelihood, okay? And that is the term that I'm maximizing in my M step, right? In my M step, I'm looking at the completed, at the expected complete data log likelihood. The expectation is going under the summation and for the k-means or the Gaussian mixture case, I'm getting these tau, these responsibilities. So this is what we optimized on the previous slides, right, in the M step. And then notice the term at the back here doesn't have a theta, okay? So optimizing in the M step, maximizing basically the complete, uh, the expected complete data log likelihood, yeah, is really maximizing the lower bound. Okay, so that is good news. So let's see how we get to this expression. So for that one, um, we just plug everything in. Okay, here we have the summation, blah. Let's check whether this is really the right expression. So where were we starting? Okay, we were starting here at the... We were starting over here. Actually, we are interested in the log likelihood, and we can write it as a summation of this joint distribution. Okay, great. That one we extended by the Q, and we applied Jensen's inequality to define this bound. And now we have the joint distribution up here and the Q of Z at the bottom. So let's see how we change that expression. So that is the right starting point. Great. Now we're using the rule of the logarithm, right? The logarithm of a fraction or the logarithm of a product is the sum of the factors. So it's the logarithm of the top part plus the logarithm of the, min the bottom part, but since it's the bottom part, we put a minus sign in front because the bottom part is like Q of Z to the power of minus one. And the minus one is an exponent, I can drag it in front of the logarithm, okay? So this is like a very standard form of deriving things, and maybe this is the nicest demo that the logarithm rules are useful, uh, is some computation like that one. Okay, great. So I am turn this logarithm here, the logarithm of a fraction into a sum of two logarithms, and then I split the term into two sums. Okay, great. So the first term here, that is really the expectation of the logarithm of p of x comma z, which is the complete data log likelihood, where I'm taking, calculating the expectation with respect to z. Okay? So this summation is really the expected complete data log likelihood that we looked at. So in the last term, the negative summation of the log of, of qz, that has a name, 
and it's called entropy, H of Q, where I'm not writing Q of Z, but H of Q. So the H is really a function, right, where the, where the variable Z is not a free variable anymore. As you can see, the variable Z is bound by the summation operator. So it's really a function that takes a distribution and then calculates a single number. So now, um, what we conclude from Z1 is the M step is maximizing the lower bound nicely for a fixed Q. So when I fix the Q, the back term is constant, and I'm calculating here really the expected complete data log likelihood. Now, what is the entropy? So just a short introduction to the entropy. So the entropy expression that we've seen is the one from the textbook that you see in books like from Thomas Cover and uh, I think Joy Thomas. So those are the two authors called Information Theory. That's a very nice book. And that is the starting point. And it can be also viewed as the expectation yeah, of minus log Q of Z. Okay. Wow, why would you do that? So what does it mean? Why taking the logarithm of probabilities? That is a very essential concept for information theory. Yeah? Entropy is basically measuring the randomness of a random variable. Okay? For that one, um, let's look at an example maybe first. So let's take a random variable that, that, is, that is relevant for the um, World Championship. Okay? OK, I don't hope I, I'm setting the expectations too high. At the end, it's, it's a Bernoulli variable, OK? But that's what the World Championship is about, about lots of Bernoulli variables. So let's say we have a random variable x. And it's the output of a Bernoulli variable with parameter theta. Oh, thank you. Or we could also say it's a coin with parameter theta. OK, great. And this is the outcome of the final. Yeah? Or it's the outcome of Morocco against Spain, for example. Right? And there are certain thetas. And actually, these thetas are always on these websites. You can see them, right? There are these companies who would like you to put you into betting money on one of the games. And there you see the theta. You can derive it from these numbers. So you can, I don't know, there's something like a rate saying 10 euro for Spain and 120 euro for Morocco, right? And this, this, this is basically what everyone believes before the game starts. And those are, I, I don't know exactly what numbers they show. I think, I guess, if you bet on Spain with some money, you get 10 euro. And if you bet on Morocco, you get 120 euro, or something like this. OK? But you can turn these odds, I think they are called odds, I think you can turn them into theta. OK? So, and um, now, how is the randomness of a game, Spain against Morocco? It's not very random, right? So we all believe that Spain wins, right? So there's not so much information content in there. Only if Morocco wins, of course. So that's the, that makes it to the first page of the newspaper. Let's take some other teams. I don't know, France against Brazil or something. So two super teams, and yeah, we don't know much about it. So. The result is really giving us a lot of information. So we would expect that a coin that has parameter theta yeah, being equal to a half, that would give us a lot of information. Yeah. And an unfair coin, let's say 100, yeah, that is only very little information. I don't know, Portugal against South Korea or something, I think they, they won very high. Um, so it would be nice if the entropy calculated on these ones would give us here a larger number, since it's more random, and here a smaller number. And that is exactly what will happen okay, with our formula. So let's write down again the entropy. Now let's say for a Bernoulli experiment, and then I, I replace now my Q with a parameter. Okay, Sure, I can do that. And that is minus theta times logarithm of theta minus 1 minus theta. So that's the other probability times the logarithm of 1 minus theta. OK. 
And now let's see what we get. So for the theta being equal to 1 half, so that is the one that is easy to calculate. So that would be minus a half and log of a half. Now it's a question, what logarithm are we using here? We can freely choose. It doesn't matter very much. It's just off by a constant. Let's say we take the logarithm of 2. OK, then we have minus 1 half. Logarithm of 1 half is minus 1. OK, so we get a plus 1 half. And over here we have again a half and again a half, so we get the same thing. So we get a half plus a half. So this is equal to 1. The entropy of 1 half is 1. So what would be a good unit? The outcome of a single coin, what is the information unit that we would use? Of course, it's bits, right? So we get one bit. So if we take the two logarithm, the correct unit for the entropy is bits. Okay. If we would take the natural logarithm, I think it's called nets. So there's another one that is nets. I don't know. I have it from the book from Thomas Cover. So let's calculate that one. I don't know. I just made this example up. Let's hope for the best that I can calculate it. So it will be minus 100. And then I'm having the two logarithm of 100. Oh, that's not so easy. So let's take another number. So let's take 1,024. So that's simpler. OK, then the logarithm of 1,024 is 10. OK, and it will be minus 10. OK, so we get 10 divided by 100 minus. And here I'm having now, OK, maybe not such a great choice, my numbers. So this is the probability. The other one, and now I need to take the logarithm of that one. Hmm, too bad. So I approximate, OK? So this will be logarithm of, um, I think, the top one, so this one minus the logarithm of the bottom one. And for the bottom one, we know already it's 10, OK? So minus 10. OK, let's see whether I get something meaningful out of this one. So this one minus, let's, oh, this is 23. So logarithm of 1023, it will be something like 9.9, .9, approximately. I don't know it exactly. OK, and what about that one? That one is also something like, I don't know, 0 0.99, approximately, something like this. OK, so we have some number close to 1. And here we have a difference of a number which is slightly smaller, so we get plus 0 0.1, right? So that is this one, so 0 0.1, times uh, 1999. So I guess, so at the end, this will be something like 0 0.099, something like that. OK, and the one, this is 0 0.1. So at the end, I think we get something like, like this. OK, that was a physicist calculation, I guess. But um, uh, you see the point. So um, we can also plot it for all parameters, this function. OK, so let's plot it for all parameters. So here I'm having the entropy of theta. And here I'm having theta going from 0 to 1. Uh, let's take an extreme point. Oh, let's do this for <coughs> theta being equal to 0. <coughs> can I do it? <coughs> oh, what's the logarithm of 0? I think it's minus infinity, right? OK. So it will be minus infinity, luckily, times 0. Great, that's 0. OK. And here I'm having 1 times um, logarithm of 1, right? And that is 1. Huh. I don't know. I want to have it that then the entropy is also 0. OK, so I think that is the right value. Yes? Ah, OK, great. Ah, OK, so we have 0 times infinity minus logarithm of 0, uh, of 1 is 0. Awesome. Great, thank you. So it's a bit hand wavy. However, the curve looks like this. So it's very reasonable to have here that one. So how high is it? It's a half, OK? And of course, this is right at a half. And it's nicely measuring the information content of a single coin. OK, so that's the entropy. Did you know the ent entropy before? 
a little bit. Oh, I calculated it. Oh, it's great if people pay attention. Uh, you see, I'm improvising here, right? I'm like a jazz musician who plays a solo, but um, I sometimes make mistakes. And only the experts here, the, 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 the real musicians. OK, great. OK, so this is the entropy. It's a very nice concept. It also works with dice. It also works with continuous random variables. And it's super important for communication. So your cell phone yeah, is transmitting information from here to the next cellular antenna. And it's all relying on the theory from information theory that this is efficient, that, that, that it works at all. Okay, So it's a very basic theory. Maybe the, the big guy in this area is Claude Shannon. So I think he invented it during his master's thesis. Or maybe that's an exaggeration. Please check it. Okay, Check the Wikipedia page, what he did for his master's thesis. But what did he do for his master thesis? Uh, no, he did something else for his master thesis. I think he, he found a way to mathematic to mathematicize or to write a formula down for an electric circuit. I think that's it. So you have an electric circuit, and he wrote a mathematical formula that you can then manipulate with algebra, and then you get a new circuit calculating the same thing. Okay, and I think that was his master thesis. Also quite amazing. Question. Um, so, okay, so why call this information at all? Because I'm flipping a coin, okay, so I'm flipping it, and now I won't tell you, okay, you don't know the result. Now I tell you the result. The result is uh, heads or tails, what is it if the numbers are showing up? In German it's Kopf oder Zahl, so it's Zahl. Okay, tails, oh, heads make sense, yeah, so it's tails. How much information did you gain? One bit. You got a on or off. So in a computer, one bit is just 0 or 1, right? And I just gave you this amount of information, either a 0 or a 1. And beforehand, you don't know which one it is. So you really got one bit. Doesn't convince you. Let's say I'm throwing eight coins. Then how many possibilities are there? Are two to the eight or something? So if I give it to you, I give you one byte, right? So I give you the, there are eight wires, and some are on and some are off, and I give you the information. OK? Makes sense? Now, just a second. For the, for the logarithm, typically for um, discrete random variables, we often take the log 2, and then we measuring in bits. And that's something that is like very natural to computer scientists. However, as I say, uh, when you put the, the natural logarithm here, and you know there's a formula, ah, I forgot exactly how it is. You can always convert anything into anything else, right? In one logarithm, you can always convert it into the other one. Does anyone know? So how, what's the logarithm of alpha? Isn't it the divided by the logarithm of alpha or something? Oh, what, how does it work? Or the logarithm of x? Is it, that, is it now right? Something like this? Hmm? I need another what? OK, but the logarithm of x with respect to alpha can be always written as a logarithm with respect to 2. And then there's some constant factor. This one? Is it that one? Oh. Is it right? Oh, I'm glad. OK, what I'm saying is, when you change the basis of the logarithm, there's just a constant factor that you can drag out of the whole equation. And then it's just scaling the result. So there is a scaling factor from bits to nets, for example. 
and then it doesn't matter. You choose the one that you like. Um, there's another thing. There's also differential entropy, which you typically write with a little h. And then you, for example, have a density. And that will be the minus the integral of px logarithm of px. However, that one is a little bit more funny. It can get negative numbers as well, which is kind of strange. But this is really measuring amount of information. In particular, if you have two independent coins and you throw them, how much information do you get? You get two bits, right? And actually, I show it on the slide. You can show that down here, nice property, if you have two independent random experiments, so the density is factorizing like that, OK? Then it turns out that the joint entropy is the summation of the single entropies. OK? So it has nice properties. By the way, there's this question, so why taking logs of probabilities? What does it really mean, right? So what does it mean? And so here's, suppose you have a fair coin, then the um, one explanation for me is starting with the probability of 1 half, taking minus log of 0.5 gives you this 1, which is like a bit. And then the logarithm here is nice because it turns something that is a product, like a product of two densities, into a summation. And this summation then will be the summation of the entropies at the end. Yeah, so that's why applying the logarithms to something like probabilities is, is make, giving you some additive quantity. Yeah, so some, now you can add up things. Okay, so that's a nice thing. By the way, you could also interpret the entropy as the expected information content. Okay, the expectation, the amount of information that you can expect. And again, when Spain plays against Morocco, I mean, now everything changed, but until yesterday, yeah, when Spain plays against Morocco, Morocco the average information content is very small. Yeah? So it's very likely Spain wins, and then it's very unlikely that uh, Morocco wins. So basically, this is probability that um, Morocco wins. So this number might be large, the information content, right? Logarithm of 100 is 100 or something. But the probability in front is very small. And this probability is quite large, and this is like a reasonable number. And so the information content overall is very low, the average information content. But that's the logarithm of the probability of Morocco winning is very large, as a negative logarithm, so it made it on the first page of the newspaper. Okay? So maybe you can use the newspaper headlines to measure entropy of, of results, okay, of events. Okay, so far so good. So this is entropy, right? And uh, when you first see it, I don't see, think you study, do you study it in Vrooms? Do you know Vrooms, this lecture? By the way, what does Vrooms stand for? Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung? Ah, okay, Wahrscheinlichkeitsrechnung und mathematische Statistik, so probability theory and mathematical statistics. And um, I don't think you talk about entropy very often there. However, it's really an, a very interesting concept. It's also used in reinforcement learning. Yeah, when, when they play Atari games, then you want to, you have some entropy prior. Yeah, what does it mean? It means initially you should be random. You should really try all actions. And you shouldn't stick to one that gave you like a, a quick reward. You should still stay and explore. And that basically by increasing the entropy of it, kind of you are ensuring that. So it's some very nice concept. Or also in decision trees. I don't know when other lectures whether you study decision trees. So basically, on which variable should you split your tree? Pick the one with the largest entropy. OK? So that is the best one. Or here's another question. Or the, here's, here's another 20 questions. So you know maybe 20 questions. So you are uh, searching for a person, right? For example, Boris Becker. And you are, are allowed to ask questions, yeah? You should ask questions, yeah, which have the highest entropy. And of course, which is the highest entropy? You ask whether it's female or male, OK? So that is like a 50-50 question. And then maybe you ask whether it's a celebrity or not, and so on and so forth. So that's where the entropy all plays a role in these kind of things, right? Also, there are these things. You have like nine spheres, and you're allowed to weigh three times, and you should find the one that is 
having more weight or less weight or do they all have the same with the least amount of things. So you, so you should always do the high entropy questions. Okay? Okay, I hope you like entropy as much as I do. So that's a really nice concept and it pops up in our mathematics here, which is nice. Let's get back to the deep insight. So what were we talking about? So here's the deep insight. We want to maximize the normal incomplete log likelihood. That's our goal. And we found a nice lower bound using the Ensign's inequality. Okay. And now we are just massaging the expression of it to get like some nice interpretable terms here. And one term is basically the, um, the complete data log likelihood, the expected complete data log likelihood, which is one that we actually maximize with our algorithm that we've seen before. But now we proved that this thing will increase basically the lower bound for the log likelihood. Okay? Of course, if I manipulate the theta, also the L of theta will change. So by maximizing that one, I'm ideally also maximizing the other one. And the other term is constant. Okay? Um, so that this is now also the, um, the entropy here. I don't have more to say about it, why the entropy is here. Maybe there is more to say about it. But let's go on to the E step. Here's another deep insight. Okay? So this is also a cool insight. And it's basically the same story. You start with the lower bound, and then you massage it to get some nice expression. And we get another nice expression from information theory, the so-called KL divergence. Before I explain to you what the KL divergence is, okay, um, let's study the last expression a little bit further. Or do you first want to see the derivation? Uh, let's first do the derivation, okay. So what are we doing next? We are replacing this P of X comma Z with two other expressions. So what rule did I use? Base rule is always, it's like in other classes where you always say Jesus or something else. That's here the right answer. And in a way, yes, it is base rule, but actually it's a more specific one. It's a product rule in this case. So it's just a product rule, not the full. Base rule is like product rule squared, kind of, okay? But you're right, yeah, I've just applied this very simple rule from probability, and then again I'm reshuffling the terms, okay? The fraction of P of Z divided by Q of Z, I put into the first one, the first one, and the p of x I put into the last one. Then in the last one, my log p of x given theta doesn't have a z. So I can drag it out of the summation, and the sum is equal to 1. Okay? So that one just disappears, the summation over here. So I end up with the log p of x, which is a very curious expression, because it's just our log likelihood of the incomplete data. Okay? So in this inequality, we have it on both sides. And then there's an expression in front of it, which is the so-called KL divergence. And that is an expression from information theory which is measuring distances between probability distributions. Okay? And it's measuring the distances in the most natural way, whatever that means. Before I say more about the KL divergence, so if I change this inequality a little bit, yeah, for example, I can take the difference of L of theta minus my lower bound, okay, and then if I plug everything in, I get exactly the KL divergence. So the gap between my lower bound and the thing that I want to optimize is exactly the KL divergence, okay? And the KL divergence, it can be shown, I showed in two slides, that it's always positive. Interesting. So why is this an in deep insight into the E step? Because in the E step, we keep the theta fixed, so this theta here is fixed and we are changing the Q. And how do we change it? We replace it by P of Z given X and theta. So basically it means in the E step we are closing the gap. Okay? So we are choosing the Q of Z which is minimizing the KL divergence. And it's minimized by setting Q of Z being equal to P of Z given X and the current theta. Okay? Okay, so far so good. Let's talk a little bit about KL divergence. So this is for comparing two densities, okay? So it can be written as a summation with respect to one of them, yeah, but it's not symmetric. So it's a difference whether I calculate the KL divergence between Q and P and P and Q. And that's why it's called a divergence and not a, dif a distance, okay? 
because it's asymmetric. So you can also turn, put a minus sign in front, and you need to swap the quotient. Okay, and you can also um, write it as an expectation. So it's the expectation of some ratio between two distributions. So now, how does it compare these two distributions? Basically, the logarithm of 1, as I just learned, is 0. Okay? So if the density of q and the density of p are the same, yeah, then this won't contribute anything to the sum. right? So if p of and q is equal, then the logarithm of 1 is equal to 0, and the whole thing will be 0. Okay? However, if they differ, yeah, then I will get some number, and I weight it with the probability from the q. So let's draw a picture for that one. Um, Let's draw two probability distributions. OK, so here's one. And here's another one. OK, so let's say this is p of x, uh, p of z, and this is q of z. Now, I could ask, so what is the KL divergence of q and p? And again, notice the z is inside the summation. OK. In that case, it's the expectation where I'm taking the expectation of z with respect to q of this fraction. And I forgot whether it's like that or the other way around. Is that the right one? It's wrong? OK, then I put a minus sign here. OK, good. So here I'm only interested in the q, and I don't care for areas like here. So great, p of z is larger than I am. I don't care, right? My probability is small. OK, so I'm comparing the two distributions from the perspective of q. OK? So it should be the same where my q of z is large. So that's the area where I'm counting, OK? And I could calculate the KL divergence the other way around. And in that case, it's minus expectation z being distributed according to p. Logarithm, and now I think I need to swap it here as well. And this is asking, OK, now p of z is the interesting one. So how am I comparing? And then I have here a very bad area, which is now counting a lot. So the bottom term will take this part into account, and the top term will ignore this part. OK? So it's asymmetric. There is something in differential geometry, which I don't know very well, but there's a so-called the area information theory. Uh, not information theory. There's, an, there's some interesting area called information. And now comes another fancy word, geometry. And this is basically differential geometry for probability distributions. And there one can show that the KL diversion is an alpha divergence. Okay? And this is now a statement. I could print on my t-shirt here for parties. I can't explain you what an alpha divergence is. But if you're a mathematician, you might appreciate it. However, it's the right way to compare true probability distributions. OK? The picture here is, did I draw this picture already? So on one axis, there's a mu. And on the other one, there's a sigma squared. And I'm talking about Gaussian distributions. OK? So every point in here is a Gaussian distribution. And notice there's no access to the negative one, because sigma is always positive. So it's only a half space. So this is the half space of all Gaussian distributions. And now the question is, what are the isolines on this space? OK, so who has the same distance around this one? And I, don't, I couldn't draw it, but maybe it's something like this, or it could have any shape. So the Euclidean distance makes only sense if you're in an isotropic space, kind of. But this is not isotropic. Isotropic means every direction is alike. But that's not the case here. OK? So here we have some other geometry, the information geometry. And here, suddenly, isolines or geodeten, geodesic lines, could look like this. OK? There could be some funny 
distribution, uh, some funny ways. Why is that relevant? Let's say you do gradient descent on the parameters here, yeah? Then actually you shouldn't use the gradient directly, but you should use the right geometry. So you should multiply it with the, with the Riemannian metric tensor, which is in the KL divergence, okay? So you need to have the right metric. And then this is called natural gradient. So if you are interested in, in this connection to mathematics, uh, you could Google this paper from Shunichi Amari. It's called Natural Gradient Works Efficiently in Learning. Okay, so that's like a classical paper where this Amari who invented this area kind of shows that it's useful for machine learning. Okay, it's quite, quite nice. Again, natural gradients, where do they pop up? In reinforcement learning, in other areas for ICAs. So you can apply it everywhere once you have it. So this is the KL divergence. It's like the natural way to compare things in this probability space, okay? So what properties does it have? It's always greater or equal to zero. So that's a good property for something like a distance. And we can prove it. I show it on the next slide, just a second. So here's a proof. So you start with zero being log one. I could have looked on my slides for that one. And then I put the summation of the p of z in here, which is also equal to one. Then I extend it with my q of z as before. Then I apply Jensen's inequality again, okay? And then this is the expression for the negative KL diversions. Okay, so that is the proof that it's always positive. Nice. So I said already Z1 that it's not symmetric. One is comparing P and Q where Q is large and the other way around. And we use this weird notation with the bars. So that's just convention. We could put a comma here. That's the same thing, OK? Um, interestingly, there's also an equation with KL diversions at entropy. And so the negative entropy corresponds to the KL diversion up to a constant. Yeah, let me show you that one on the next slide. So let's say you have the discrete uniform distribution for a dice, OK? So then P of Z is equal to 1 divided by K. And then if you write out the KL diversions, of a distribution to this uniform distribution, it turns out to be just the negative entropy up to a constant. So that's kind of interesting. So that KL diversion is measuring distance, or other words, entropy is measuring the distance to the most random distribution, okay? That's kind of interesting. It also holds for continuous variables. Okay, again, just an excursion that you see that these concepts exist. And they ask, answer a very important question about randomness of random variables and about distances between probability distributions. So let's get back to the slide to appreciate it. So in the E step, we are changing the responsibilities. So we are changing the distribution of the Z, right? And we are we're replacing the prior distribution, which depended on theta zero, with a new distribution, which should depend on the new thetas. And this is exactly the distribution P of Z given X and theta. And so the E step is just closing the gap by setting the Q of Z just to the perfect solution. Okay? So far, so good. So that's what I'm just saying, it said, right? Um, yes, the gap is just the KL divergence, and the E step is closing the gap by choosing the Q of Z in a particular way. Right, you might have been already afraid, okay, I know how to optimize with respect to a parameter vector theta, calculate derivatives, how do I optimize with respect to a function q? So that's more complicated, you need functional derivatives or something, something that is beyond my skills. However, in this case, from the KL diversion, you know how to choose it, so you just fix it like that, so that's exactly the step. Okay, so far so good. So, um, notation-wise, I now wrote like Q is equal to PZ and so on. However, I should have written something Q of Z is equal to Z1, but then for all Z, right? The reason is I'm using this convention that the variable Z is telling me what distribution I'm talking about, right? And at this point, I see that it's a bit limiting. So I could have written it like this with Q with a dot, but that is unfortunate because then I don't know what the dot is referring to. Okay, so I, I hope you know what I mean if I write Q is equal to P of Z, blah, blah, blah. 
Okay, it's just a notation. So here's our super general form of the EM algorithm. So we have an observed variable, we have a latent variable, which we don't know, which could be also missing data. Yeah? And we have a joint probabilistic model where we have the observed data and the missing data in, and some parameter vector. We randomly initialize the theta 0, and then we do an E step and an M step. In the E step, we are basically maximizing the lower bound by setting the Q to its optimal value, by basically closing the gap, okay, by setting the KL divergence to 0. Um, and then in the M step, we are doing some gradient solving, right? Calculate the gradient of this expression with respect to theta. And that is basically the same as the arc marks of minimizing the expected complete data log likelihood, right? That was the other deep inside. Yeah, so the lower bound is the thing to look at. And once we do it by setting the Q to a particular distribution compatible with the current theta, and the other one is by maximizing the expected complete data log likelihood. And everything that we've seen before in the lecture is a special case of that one. Yeah? Um, of course, this can be viewed even more general, right? So why not? So we learned something about optimization. So this EAM procedure is, of course, also a special case of something else. And why am I telling you? I mean, first of all, EM now can be used everywhere where you have missing data. You can use these equations. However, there's something more general, optimization using an auxiliary function. And EM is in, uh, some instance of that one. So it's, it's cute to, to learn about it. So the L, the lower bound, is some auxiliary function. And optimization with the auxiliary function works like this. Suppose you want to maximize some function. L of theta, let's forget about what it was. It's any function, any non-convex complicated function. You want to maximize it. We introduce an auxiliary function with a couple of properties. First of all, we want to have it easily maximizable in theta, in the first argument, right? Our lower bound had this property. We could take the derivative, set it to 0, and we got close form solution for the optimal values. So in our example, it was easy to maximize. And then we want to have that the um, L of theta is touching our auxiliary function at the point where we plug in both parameters, putting them the same. And that is basically what we're doing in the E step. In the E step, we are choosing the distribution of the, of the Z such that they are matching again the theta that we have. And that is like saying, I'm plugging in the theta at the second location. And so my auxiliary function should be chosen that it's touching the complicated function that I want to optimize. OK? Great. And then we need to guarantee that it, it is a lower bound everywhere for everyone. OK? And we also shown this property. Yeah? If we have that, then um, I think I can also draw a picture. Uh, maybe I, don't, I better don't draw a picture anymore. Let's see. So then we can do the M and the E steps. So let's see what, how this goes. So our starting point is, of course, the initial value, OK? And we want to maximize this function. So first of all, it touches it. So we can replace it with the L of theta 0, theta 0. So far, so good, right? This is like calculating initial responsibilities, OK? It could be viewed like an E step in a way. Then we do the M step, which means we maximize in the first input. And maximizing in the first input means we get something which is even larger than that what we had before. But we keep the second parameter fixed. OK? Once we have done that, again, we are closing the gap by replacing the second parameter with the theta 1. Again, we know, um, where do we get this from? Oh, yeah, it is the lower bound for any theta 0. So. Um, Basically, we know if both are the same, this is the L theta 0. And that basically means from the lower bound that we must have increased the previous expression, right? Great. And so on and so forth. And this is exactly what EM is doing. It's performing a greedy hill climbing yeah, for, our ex for our very complicated function by having this sequence of theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, and so forth such that we are always increasing or staying the same. So we might end up in a local optimum, OK? So there could be problems. 
Um, okay, so far so good. So here's the summary of today. So in the general form, basically this is the recipe, okay? K-means is a special case of that one, and typically it's heuristically motivated, but it can be derived from this approach. Fitting a Gaussian mixture model is also a special case of this very general point of view. Um, and again, it is a special case of auxiliary function optimization, which is something useful that to have in your toolbox. And at the end, by the way, EM is a very general solution for the missing data problem. So if you have a missing data problem, you have observable variables and ob variables that you haven't observed. And if you have a joint probabilistic model, for example, you could estimate the z with linear regression, or you could estimate the z with a neural network, or whatever you like. Yeah? If you can then calculate the required expectations and do the maximization in a nice fashion, you can use EM to solve your missing data problem. Okay? That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the excursion into information theory. It's something which is not essential to machine learning, but it's good to know that it exists. And maybe you can apply it at some point. Okay, so see you next Monday.